Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to Swayam Prabha. We are in the 8th session of our course on Law of Contracts and in today's session we will be discussing the topic of Discharge of Contract and this is Dr. Sumiti Ahuja, Assistant Professor, Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. The topics which we will be taking up in under Discharge of Contract are as you can see on your screens, Meaning of Discharge of Contract, Modes of Discharge of Contract. Dis, uh, and the various modes of discharge of contract we will be discussing are discharge by performance, discharge by breach, discharge by impossibility followed by discharge by mutual agreement or what we also say mutual consent. It will be followed by a discussion on doctrine of frustration or the principle of supervening impossibility of performance. We will be discussing grounds of frustration and its effect as well as the exceptions pertaining to it and the today's uh, session, the 8th session would be concluded with a discussion on force major clause. To start with meaning of discharge of contract, what do we understand by the term discharge here? When we say discharge of contract, we are trying to say that the contract has come to an end and no more are the parties to that contract under an obligation to fulfill the oblig uh, fulfill the terms so it says once a contract has been formed the very next step is the discharge of contract generally or as generally understood or we can say the most common mode of discharge of contract is by performance that is both the parties under the contract have fulfilled their respective obligations under the contract and therefore contract has been uh, it has come to an end. So, as you can see, discharge of contract means end of the contract. The term discharge of contract refers to termination of contractual relations between parties. It is said to be discharged when it ceases to operate. That is, when a party's rights and responsibilities have come to an end. So, performance of as I was just telling you that yes, although the most common mode of discharge of contract is performance because the parties have already fulfilled their respective obligations as uh, incorporated under the contract and therefore contract has now come to an end. The purpose has been served if I may put it in simpler words. But this being most common, there are other modes of uh, discharge of contract as well. Mainly four modes, mainly four modes have been identified under the Indian Contract Act and as I was just telling you, there are uh, discharge by performance, by breach of contract, by uh, impossibility of performance and by mutual consent. If I may briefly uh, tell you about these four and then we can discuss all of them in detail. So, when we say discharge by performance that I have already told you in the previous uh, slide that by performance means that you have fulfilled your obligations, you have kept your promises and you have completed your work or your responsibility under the contract. When we say discharge by breach, in one of our earlier sessions we have discussed as to what breach means. Breach means non-fulfillment. So, in contrast to performance or if you can say in contradiction to performance, breach means that I will I'll refer to one party here. So, one of the parties to the contract has decided not to fulfill the obligation under the contract or not to fulfill that obligation as had been decided under the contract. There are remedies provided under the Indian Contract Act for uh, commission of breach but that we will be discussing in the next session. The third is discharge by impossibility of performance. Now, one we said performance, here we are talking about impossibility of performance. 
it's not like breach that a party is not willing to perform the promise absolutely or as a whole or is not willing to perform it in the manner it is supposed to be performed here we are talking about impossibility of performance due to conditions or due to reasons beyond control of the parties the two parties the contract now has become impossible to be performed that can be due to some factual uh, change in factual scenario change in subject mat uh, change in circumstances destruction of subject matter etc and or, or it may be uh, legal also in the sense there uh, a new law has uh, once you entered into a contract valid contract a new law has come into picture and that law has made the subject matter or maybe dealing in the subject matter of your contract to be unlawful so it makes it impossible to be performed and when we talk about the fourth most common mode of discharge of contract we mean that the two parties like we say consensus ad idem that is parties need to agree on the same thing in the same sense in order to enter into a valid contract similarly when we talk about discharge by mutual consent or mutual agreement the parties have mutually decided either to substitute the old contract with a new one or maybe they have uh, decided to make certain uh, alterations in the terms of the contract or maybe they have uh, th they have decided that they do not wish to uh, fulfill any of the obligations under the contract and mutually they have decided to repudiate or terminate the contract without having performed the obligations under it we'll start with discussing in detail the first mode of discharge of contract that is discharge by performance fulfillment of obligations set out under the contract this is important set out under the contract the terms of the contract have to be performed or have to be fulfilled as it is that is why fulfillment of obligations set out under the contract within specified time and in manner prescribed by the parties to the contract so fulfillment of obligations as it is given under the contract within specified time that is period mentioned within the contract and in the manner prescribed that is in the manner which has been prescribed by the other party which has been mutually decided by the two parties liability of parties comes to an end so once the parties have fulfilled their respective obligation they are no more liable to each other under a contract remember again and again i have been emphasizing in our sessions that uh, whenever we talk about contract we say uh, therein duties are primarily fixed by the parties to the contract so once both the parties have fulfilled their duties or uh, duties or obligations towards each other and the purpose has been served of the contract thereafter liability of both the parties has come to an end if only one of the parties performs his or her obligations then that party alone is discharged this party gets right to take action against the defaulting party here we are trying to make a small reference to the concept of breach so we are saying that see generally when we say discharge by performance we mean both the parties are discharged from performance any more because obligations have been fulfilled here we are saying that consider a scenario wherein one party has fulfilled the obligation but second party commits a default or say refuses to fulfill the obligation entirely or in part or as the case may be but not as per the terms of the contract so in that case only that party that particular party which has uh, performed his or her obligations under the contract will be discharged by performance or will be discharged from further performance and that party will also get a right to approach the court when we say right to take action we are saying that party will get a right to approach the court and claim relief against the other party who is the defaulting party here so discharge by performance can be of two types first is actual performance second is attempted performance let's see what both of them mean so the two types of uh, discharge of performance are 
as you can see on the screens actual performance and attempted performance so when we say actual performance we mean when both parties have met their obligations a contract is said to be discharged so actually has been performed both have performed their obligations performance should be thorough and precise in accordance with conditions of agreement majority of contracts are discharged by performing in this manner so which means it is the most common mode of discharge of uh, contract when we say attempted performance it is simply an offer to carry out contractual obligations that means one of the party is willing to perform his or her obligations under the contract and makes an offer to perform those obligations to the other party promisor agrees to perform the obligations but promisee refuses to accept it that is i am willing to perform my bit i am willing to perform my obligation but the other party is refusing to accept that performance from my side as per the terms of the contract this is referred to as discharge of contract by attempted performance or what we also uh, what we are also aware of as tender of performance so one party party is ready to tender performance from his or her side but the other party is refusing to accept such performance that is what we mean by attempted performance now you can see for yourself that how lengthy is this entire concept of uh, performance of contracts which is given under chapter 4 of the indian contract act uh, which is spread over sections 37 to 67 of the indian contract act so for uh, for the sake of convenience i have on the screen divided these uh, group of sections and have uh, tried to make it easier for you to understand that the provisions or the sections 37 to 39 deal with contracts which must be performed here in reference is made to the performance of contract reference is made to tender of performance reference is also made to a concept called anticipatory breach we would be getting into details of anticipatory breach as well later in this session is uh, later in this session itself one point uh, again i would like to highlight here that you need to remember that say for example two parties have entered into a contract and say one of them dies so if the contract say was related to uh, sale of goods then the legal representatives of that person who has died will uh, you can say will substitute that party and will fulfill the obligations under the contract the law says uh, if the contract provides otherwise this is what the actual picture is or say for example if the subject matter of the contract is say i am a painter and uh, i have been given this task or i have entered into a contract with someone wherein i have to paint a sketch uh, of that person right and say something happens something happens to me and uh, let me not talk about myself let's talk about third person so that third person dies right and is not able to fulfill the obligation i just now told you that according to the indian contract act unless the con unless the contract provides otherwise the person the the party who dies will be substituted by his or her legal representatives but one exception you have to keep in mind that is when the subject matter of the contract deals with some personal skill some personal skill is involved like i am a painter here it's not necessary that every member of my family is a good painter as good as i am right so in that situation in these kind of contracts the moment party dies that party dies the painter dies he or she cannot be substituted by legal representative that particular contract comes to an end it because it becomes impossible to be performed the next set of sections you can see on your screens sections 40 to 45 they deal with by whom contracts must be performed generally we our basic understanding is if the two parties who have entered into the contract they are bound by the obligations under the contract and they are supposed to perform the terms of the contract now what if say uh, someone sold me something and uh, 
at a later date I have to make the payment to that person. But due to some reasons I am not able to make that payment and a third person on my behalf makes that payment. And that payment which has been made by the third person is accepted by the, uh, the other side, the other party. Once that payment has been accepted, later on no action can be taken against me by the other party saying that performance was not uh, done or obligation was not fulfilled by the concerned party. Because on my behalf someone else has already given you that amount of money which you have accepted. So you have a choice, either you uh, do not accept or insist that I should perform the obligation instead of the person who has been either authorized by me or who is trying to help me out. If either you do not accept the performance and insist that I should perform it, but if you have accepted the performance uh, by, uh, uh, from my side, thereafter you cannot insist on a re-performance from me. Sections 46 to 50 deal with time and place for performance. They deal with things like when time is of the essence of the contract, that is when parties have decided upon a specific time during which or by which the contract has to be completed, contract has to be fulfilled. They are under an obligation to fulfill the contract or the obligations within that time period. Sections 51 to 58, performance of reciprocal promises. Now reciprocal, reciprocal means that both the parties are doing something in return for each other. When we say performance of reciprocal promises, we are trying to say that if I have, uh, if I have promised something to do uh, for you, in return of that you have also promised something to me that you will be doing for me. So, Promise in return of promise is what we call as reciprocal promise, right? So when we talk about performance of reciprocal promises, these uh, set of provisions basically are dealing with uh, as to w uh, what if uh, in uh, of a situation basically wherein say uh, there is an order of performance uh, according to which both the parties have to act. Say for example, in the contract it has been decided that once I have delivered the goods or I have gotten the goods delivered to your go down, thereafter within a period of 7 days you have to make the payment to me uh, for the goods, right. So as per the contract, the order of performance is firstly I will have to deliver the goods to you, thereafter you will make the requisite payment to me, right. It cannot be vice versa. So unless and until I have performed my part of promise, you would not be in a position to perform your part. 59 to 61 talks about appropriation of payments. So here for example, say there are uh, two parties, one party is the creditor, the other is a debtor. So say for example, the debtor has taken uh, three loans, three loans from the creditor and on a particular designated date, uh, that person, the debtor returns a particular sum of money. Now. According to appropriation of payments, these provisions basically deal with the fact that when the debtor is uh, repay, repaying a particular, repaying a loan, I am not saying particular, but repaying a certain amount to the creditor which was due, how will the creditor use that amount or appropriate that amount or that payment against those debts? That is what 59 to 61 deal with. Now 62 to 67 deals with contracts which need not be performed. Under these set of sections we would be discussing about the discharge of, uh, uh, discharge of a contract by mutual agreement or mutual consent. For example, where the parties have mutually decided to terminate the contract or do away with the contract. So we can justify these terms here then which need not be performed because the parties have decided so. This is one of the examples. Let us move on after discharge by performance, let us move on to the second uh, category or second mode of discharge that is discharge by breach. Breach means refusal to fulfill obligations under a contract. Refusal, performance was to fulfill obligations under a contract, breach is refusal to fulfill obligations under a contract. Remedies in case of breach of contract are provided under 
there are three set of remedies. We'll be discussing them in detail in the next session. But just to uh, let you know briefly, so the remedies are in three sets. First set of remedy provided under the Indian uh, Contract Act itself, Indian Contract Act of 1872. The second set of remedies is also provided under the specific Relief Act of 1963. And the third set of uh, remedies is common law remedy. Now, breach is also of two types. We had just discussed in the previous uh, mode of discharge, discharge by performance. That is, discharge by performance is also of two types. Basically, performance is two types, actual or attempted. Here, we are saying breach is also of two types, actual breach and anticipatory breach. Now, when we say actual breach, we mean that failing to perform an obligation when it is due. That means if today is the designated day when I am supposed to uh, deliver uh, the goods at your place, at the place which you have uh, informed me of, right? So today is the day and on the due date, I refuse to make that delivery of the goods and I refuse to fulfill my obligations under the contract. This is what we refer to as actual breach. That is on the due date, if you refuse to fulfill your obligation. Now, for example, failure, uh, this is the exactly same uh, example I was telling you, that is failure on part of seller to deliver goods on time or if the goods are delivered but do not meet the contract's quality or quantity specifications. Not expressly, but this concept of actual breach can be seen under the provision of section 38 under the Indian Contract Act. Now, moving on to the next type of breach that is anticipatory breach. Anticipatory breach is also known as breach by contradiction. Now, say for example, uh, exactly one month from today, we have decided, the two parties have decided that, uh, say for example, I will be performing my part or my obligation under the contract or I have to fulfill my obligation at exactly one month after, uh, from today. And say, one week from today, I, told, uh, I tell you that, see, I would not be in a position to fulfill my obligation as decided under the contract. That is, in the contract, it is one month from today. But after one week from today, I am already informing you, even before the due date has arrived, much before rather the due date has arrived, I am already perform, uh, informing you that I would not be in a position to perform the obligation, right? Now, in such a case, the party to whom this is being informed, that is the other party who has been informed that this one, the first party would not be in a position to perform the obligation on the due date, uh, that party has two options. First is, fine, you are not in a position, you would not be performing your uh, uh, obligation under the contract, fine, that means it's a breach or let's, I mean, terminate the contract there and then, right? And uh, the second option which is available with this party is to wait till the end. It is to wait till the time that is from one, uh, one month from today. Wait till that date and see maybe this person is now or at a later stage willing to perform the obligation. So after one week I am saying I would not be in a position to perform but say just a day before the due date I say you know fine. I have uh, taken care of uh, everything and now I will be able to perform my obligation. But just remember one thing, if the party is choosing to wait till the designated date or even if that party decides to terminate the contract on getting the information, anticipatory information about the uh, breach, the party, whatever option the affected party chooses. It is important that the affected party informs the other side that what option is being exercised. And this uh, concept of anticipatory breach again is not expressly mentioned under uh, the Indian Contract Act, but it has been incorporated under section 39 of the Indian Contract Act. And it says, uh, it, it basically says that uh, when one party prior to arrival of defined date for performance 
announces that it cannot or will not be able to perform material part of contractual obligation on the specified date. Thereafter, what happens? The two options, I have already told you about those two options. Now, before we move on to uh, discharge by impossibility of performance, I would first emphasize upon discharge by mutual agreement or mutual consent because under the concept of discharge of contract, impossibility of performance or what we call as doctrine of frustration under in English law is uh, one of the most important aspect under this topic. So, it needs a little more time to discuss because we will have to cover the grounds of frustration, we will have to cover the exceptions to it uh, and uh, certain case law. So, that will consume our time. So, let us first complete this uh, another mode of discharge that is discharge by mutual agreement. It says parties may mutually agree to the moment we say mutual. It means that both the parties have collectively decided to act in a particular manner. So, parties may mutually agree to firstly substitute the original contract with the new one. That is the party may uh, one of the parties to the contract may be replaced by some other party that is also one of the examples of novation right which is laid down under section 62. So, there are three concepts which have been laid down under section 62 of the Indian Contract Act which is novation, alteration and rescission. Let us see what all these three, all three of these terms mean. So, when we say novation, novation itself, see in law you need to understand this thing that most of the times you will get the meaning of a particular word from that word itself. So, moment we say novation, novation means new, something new. So, when the original contract is replaced or is substituted by new contract, it means novation. So, there is the parties are under no obligation now to perform the original contract because that original contract has come to an end now. They are now under an obligation to perform the terms of the new contract. Now, when we say alteration, alteration does not mean that you are making very major changes, you are uh, uh, just uh, modifying the entire contract because if that thing happens it will amount to novation. If you are making slight changes in certain terms of the contract, slight modification under the terms of the contract that amounts to alteration. So, changes in terms of the contract. So, the third concept uh, or the third uh, manner in which discharge by mutual agreement can take place is what we call as rescission. So, which means resigning of contract. Resigning of contract means that the two parties have mutually decided to bring that contract to an end without having performed the obligations under the contract. Now, under section 63, a concept of remission has been highlighted which is lesser fulfillment of the promise made. That is maybe I, I owe you a debt and say that debt is of uh, say uh, 10 lakhs, right. But on the just say on the due date or around the due date, I inform you that see, I would not be in a position to pay that much amount because I do not have, I have exercised, utilized all my means possible, but I would not at all be in a position to give you that huge an amount from because that amount is too huge for me to give uh, on that due date. So, I uh, propose to not, not propose exactly, but I convey to you that see at max, if I utilize everything I have, I use everything I have, at max I will be able to give you 6 lakhs. Now, remission means as I said lesser fulfillment of the promise made. So, you accept that thing and you say okay fine, give me 6 lakhs and that is okay, the uh, the obligation is fulfilled from your side, it, it, it is fulfilled, done, you have play, you have done your part. Now, it means, so once at my request, if you have accepted 6 lakhs instead of or in lieu of 10 lakhs, once you have accepted that uh, lesser performance, you cannot later on insist on getting the remaining 4 lakhs. This also incorporates the doctrine, I have already explained the concept to you, but it is also referred to as 
doctrine of accord and satisfaction. Doctrine of accord and satisfaction, which means lesser fulfillment of the promise. You are proposing to perform uh, uh, partially perform the promise, and the other person is ready to accept that that much performance, right? So it is doctrine of accord and satisfaction. Or say maybe for your uh, purpose, I can continue to I can leave this thing here. Accord and satisfaction. So it will help you. Let us see what is next. Next now we are coming to the fourth mode, fourth most commonly known mode of discharge of contract that is by impossibility of performance. You can see on your screens I have specifically mentioned section 56 part 2. Now, because section 56 part 1 deals with void agreements because it says uh, agreements which are impossible to be performed from the beginning itself. So, the, those agreements they are uh, related to subject matter or performance of something which is impossible, right. So, that part is part 1 deals with void agreements. So, for our purpose wherein we are referring to discharge by impossibility of performance, we, this portion is relevant for us which is 56 part 2 which states contract to do an act afterwards becoming impossible or unlawful. Now it says afterwards. Once you will distinguish between part 1 and part 2 of section 56 or you will read it carefully you will see that 56 part 1 uses the term agreement whereas 56 part 2 uses the term contract because section 56 part 1 deals with what we call as initial impossibility that is from the beginning itself the act is impossible to be performed right. So, that is why the term contract has not been used it is known as an agreement and it is void in nature. So, in our sessions related to void agreements we had made a reference to that. So, under section 56 part 2 it says contract to do an act afterwards becoming impossible or unlawful that means why contract because when you had entered into it it was a valid contract absolutely valid performable contract but now the situation is such that due to factual uh, changes or due to change in law the performance of that obligation under the contract has become impossible you cannot perform that now right it says a contract to do an act which after the contract is made becomes impossible first becomes impossible or by reason of some event which the promiser could not prevent unlawful it becomes void when the act becomes impossible or unlawful. So, 56 part 1 deals with void agreements whereas 56 part 2 is dealing with void contract it is void contract. Why void contract? Because it was a valid contract when made, but due to supervening, uh, supervening events, supervening impossibility, change in circumstances, etc., it has become impossible or unlawful to perform the obligation, right? So, that is why a void contract, because after the contract was made, it became void. Section 56 as I said this is dealing with part 1, part 1 of section 56 and supervening impossibility is part 2 of section 56. Initial or pre-contractual that is when the contract itself when you are that agreement itself because when you have made that agreement from the very inception that act was non-performable, impossible to be performed. That is why this term pre-contractual has been used because contract has not come into force at all. Supervening impossibility because it is post-contractual. Contract was made thereafter the impossibility came into picture and factual and legal impossibility. So, basically what I am trying to tell you here that section 56 
is can be uh, classified into two part one part two so part one deals with initial impossibility part two deals with supervening impossibility and for the part two which is supervening impossibility can be divided into two that is factual impossibility and legal impossibility sine qua non that is the important requirement for invoking section 56 more specifically i'll say here i am mentioning here 56 part 2 an existence of a valid contract between the parties the contract is yet to be performed the contract after it is entered into becomes impossible to perform due to fact or law these are the important requisites of section 56 or you can say essential requirements uh, or components of section 56 part 2 which deals with discharge by impossibility of performance essential idea upon which the doctrine of frustration of contract is based is impossibility of performance of the contract now this see uh, you will see that many a places or in many previous judgments it has been mentioned whether exactly it is uh, uh, or for that matter there is this uh, landmark judgment of satya brata ghosh versus mugni ram uh, bangar so these judgments they have highlighted the uh, point that uh, impossibility and frustration are often used as interchangeable expressions though under the Indian law section 56 which governs this aspect we refer to it as or it mentions impossibility right it becomes impossible to be performed whereas the English law identifies it as doctrine of frustration changed circumstances make the performance of the contract impossible and parties are absolved that is they are relieved from further performance of it as they did not promise to perform an impossibility they did not promise to perform an impossibility we have discussed what exactly do we mean by uh, frustration we mean by imp uh, supervening impossibility now we have to see what is the effect of frustration so fine the performance has become impossible but now what what will be the fate of that uh, contract now and what will be the uh, the if i may say the effect of such frustration parties are not required to resign the contract as the obligations of the parties get terminated immediately after contract is frustrated now in case of in the previous uh, mode of discharge that was by mutual agreement or mutual consent we just saw that it stated that a contract is uh, uh, coming to an end or is being terminated mutually that is both the parties have collectively mutually decided that they would not be no need to perform the obligations now they have mutually decided themselves to terminate it but effect of frustration is that there is no need for the parties to do anything the situation is such the circumstance is such that automatically if the act becomes impossible to be performed the two parties are absolved or relieved from their respective liabilities or obligations and the contract gets terminated immediately further obligations are discharged frustration should not be this is an important point frustration shouldn't be due to act of party to the contract that is self-induced because when we say supervening impossibility we are basically highlighting that something of such a nature happened which was beyond the control of the two parties parties had nothing to do with it whatever happened uh, they could not have done anything to control it because if they could have stopped that event from taking place which made the performance impossible then in such a case they cannot pray or that party cannot pray uh, impossibility because it was self-induced uh, frustration or self-induced impossibility now section 65 is important when we talk about void contracts or what will be the effect of a void contract so if if i may say section 56 part 2 uh, can be read with section 65 so it says 
when an agreement is discovered to be void or when a contract becomes void right so we are referring to part 1 also and we are referring to uh, the void agreements as well so when an agreement is discovered to be void or when a contract becomes void part 2 any person who has received any advantage under such agreement or contract is bound to restore it we are talking about restitution here remember we had made a mention uh, to this section or we had referred to this section under the topic of capacity to contract when we were discussing the judgment of mohri bb versus dharmadas ghosh so it says uh, or to make compensation for it to the person from whom he received it so if a contract becomes void due to some supervening impossibility coming into picture then in that particular situation now if one of the parties because before the performance could take place the contract has become impossible to be performed now the uh, obligations are not performable now then in such a situation if either of the party had received any kind of benefit the court will ask the party that particular party to return that or to restore it back to the other party now coming to the two important aspects to be discussed under the doctrine of frustration that is the grounds of doctrine of frustration or grounds of frustration of contract and certain exceptions to it grounds firstly destruction of subject matter so i have mentioned two cases here taylor versus caldwell howell versus copeland so if i may uh, uh, give you example of uh, this destruction of subject matter so in one of these cases now say for example a person is to perform in a particular theater or has a performance to give in a particular say studio also and uh, before the performance could actually take place the studio or the theater or the premises there is some kind of short circuit and the premises catch fire and is destroyed so this is what we call as destruction of subject matter and once the subject matter gets destroyed the party is absolved from liability because the performance is not uh, uh, possible now and howell versus copeland in this case uh, person had uh, uh, entered into a contract with another person wherein he was to sell his potato crop to the other person but even before the person could uh, he could do that he could fulfill his obligation under the contract the entire crop got destroyed so if that happens the destruction of subject matter it is no more performable now change of circumstances a enters into a contract with b to supply rice to him there after b's country entered into war with a's country and all the export or import transactions was stopped here the contract became impossible due to change of circumstance that is when the contract was entered into situation was absolutely fine but later stage before the obligation could be fulfilled uh, one party's country entered into war with the another party's country and all the export import transaction between these two countries was stopped here the contract became impossible due to change of circumstances next is non occurrence of contemplated event in krell versus henry now say non occurrence of contemplated event if i may just explain it say for example in this case uh, uh, a a person had entered into a contract with another person wherein he had uh taken the premises of another person on rent for a particular day because on that day procession or uh, basically king's coronation procession was to uh, take place and uh, that that house of the other party was in such a uh, was placed in such a manner was situated in such a manner that it could give a very good view of that entire procession but due to king's uh, bad health the procession got cancelled the coronation ceremony got cancelled which means non occurrence of contemplated event the event for which the premises were taken on rent that event contemplated event did not occur it was cancelled it became impossible now 
डेथ और इनकेपेसिटी ऑफ पार्टी अ पियानिस्ट अ पियानिस्ट हु हैड टू परफॉर्म एट अ पर्टिकुलर कॉन्सर्ट बिफोर द परफॉर्मेंस से द पियानिस्ट इधर डाइज और द पियानिस्ट मीट्स विद एन एक्सीडेंट एंड इज नॉट सपोज टू अपियर फॉर द कॉन्सर्ट और से ही बिका ही और शी बिकम्स ऑफ अनसाउंड माइंड राइट सो दैट इज वॉट वी कॉल एज डेथ और इन कैपेसिटी ऑफ पार्टी फर्दर द अदर ग्राउंड इफ यू कैन सी आर गवर्नमेंट लेजिस्लेटिव और एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव इंटरवेंशन दैट मीन्स सम गवर्नमेंट पॉलिसी सम रूल सम लॉ हैज कम इन टू पिक्चर विच हैज से विच हैज पुट अ प्रोहिबिशन ऑन और विच हैज रिस्ट्रिक्टेड और से अ बैंड अ पर्टिकुलर ट्रांजेक्शन और एक्सपोर्ट इम्पोर्ट ऑफ पर्टिकुलर गुड्स और सेल ऑफ अ पर्टिकुलर कमोडिटी एंड दैट वॉज द सब्जेक्ट मैटर ऑफ योर कॉन्ट्रैक्ट सो इफ द गवर्नमेंट हैज पुट अ बैन और प्रोहिबिशन ऑन सच काइंड ऑफ ट्रांजेक्शन then you cannot do that because it has become it it is a legal impossibility which has taken place intervention of war then no frustration this is something which you need to understand no frustration in case of executed contracts frustration of contract is possible only in executory contracts that is where in future consideration is there it is not possible in case of uh, those contracts wherein Uh, present consideration is involved because we say impossibility of performance means we had entered into a contract but before the due date of performance it has become impossible to be performed let's throw some light on the various exceptions to the doctrine of frustration of contract mere delay in performance does not amount to impossibility difficulty in performance is not impossibility mere commercial hardship is not an impossibility so change in economic conditions like variation in variations in price will not affect the continuation of contract and the parties are bound by the terms the defendant cannot invite the invoke or invite the doctrine of frustration by the fact of any such commercial impossibility say low profit and stop the contract so this commercial hardship is not amounting to impossibility of performance instead it is an exception to the doctrine of impossibility self induced impossibility we have already uh, understood we have already gone through it that what self impo induced impossibility is about now the other two uh, exceptions if i may highlight failure of one of the objects if the contract is made to perform several objects that is if i have entered into a contract with you and i have hired you for performing certain categories of jobs for me right not just one particular job but certain categories of jobs i have uh, uh, contracted you to do for me made to perform several objects and one of the objects failed due to any untoward incident the party cannot withdraw from performing the contract in toto that is in total as there are other objects available in the contract right so failure of one of the object does not amount to impossibility because the rest of it is yet is performable can be performed still be performed knowledge of impossibility now this is very important this is also an exception to impossibility of performance it says a already married to a woman promises to marry b's daughter fully knowing that polygamy is not allowed in the country in which he resides after marriage b's daughter learns of this and seeks divorce and a was sued for not disclosing this so he was already a married man and without informing without disclosing this he promises to marry b's daughter fully he is fully aware of the law of the land in which he lay, lives that uh, polygamy is not allowed uh, in the country and after marriage uh, b's daughter that is the person to whom he married for the second time is learn learns about this fact and she, she seeks divorce and a was also sued for not disclosing this now here a cannot claim the benefit of doctrine of frustration 
as the contract was void ab initio as it was illegal here he may note that lack of knowledge of such a law is also not an excuse for it right so even if he would not have uh, known the law and would have contracted second marriage right but the fact is that he did, did not disclose it to the other woman whom he uh, was he whom he allegedly married and in fact we know we have already discussed under the uh, session of free consent that mistake of law of the of indian law the country in which you are living is not uh, excusable or is not a defense now the last part of uh, today's presentation is dealing with the concept of force major it means basically force major relieves one or both parties from liability to perform contract obligations or contractual obligations when performance is prevented by an event or circumstance beyond the party's control you must be thinking that it is almost similar to what we just studied in uh, doctrine of frustration or impossibility of performance under section 56 part 2 but we but uh, just understand that it says we'll come to the uh, difference but let's just see further typical force major event are fire flood civil unrest or terrorist attack force major is a term used to describe a superior force event so the interpretation of the term force major is superior force purpose of a force major clause is twofold first is it allocates risk and second is puts the parties on notice of events that may suspend or excuse service right so two things allocates risk and puts the parties on notice of events that may suspend or excuse the service that is say for example so this type of clause is uh, commonly popularly if i may say known as fmc or fm clause you can say force major clause in today's times in the uh, commercial contracts you will generally find the presence of fm clause that is the force major clause now let's see uh, impossibility of performance that is section 56 part 2 visa v force major clause so what do we mean are we trying to say that there is some kind of a difference between the two are these two concepts of impossibility of performance as enshrined under section 56 part 2 different from what we just uh, read in the previous uh, slide force major clause so two points i have highlighted here while the doctrine of frustration is a common law principle or you can say the impossibility of performance this concept which has been incorporated under section 56 as we had discussed in the uh, one of the first sessions of uh, ours that mainly majorly the provisions of the uh, indian contract act have been taken from the common law principles so that's why here while the doctrine of frustration is a common law principle force major clause is a creation of contract because force major clause is something which you have to incorporate in your terms of the contract force major is a contractual remedy that is parties have incorporated parties have to in order to uh, utilize this remedy in order to make use of that remedy the parties have to incorporate it under the contract that is why force major is a contractual remedy and the terms and conditions constituting force major clause are decided by the parties prior to the execution of the contract that is because that is why i am saying you have to incorporate it under your contract right so it becomes important that parties uh, do incorporate such a clause in their respective contracts now uh, although in english law these uh, cases are treated as cases of frustration in india they would be dealt with under section 32 of the indian contract act which deals with contingent contracts or similar other provisions contained in the act now let me briefly tell you what contingent contracts are now contingent means 
and more specifically section 32 of the Indian Contract Act deals with enforcement of uh, such kind of uh, contracts the happening of the taking place of which is dependent on happening of a particular event. So, when we say contingent contracts and we are trying to relate it to somehow related to this force major, what we are trying to say is that we have incorporated in the contract, we have incorporated a force major clause in the contract that if the situation like fire, flood, civil unrest or say terrorist attacks or uh, say earthquake such kind of thing takes place then the party will be absolved from uh, his or her liability under that contract, right. Now, contingency means that we have stated that if such kind of a situation happens or if such kind of an event takes place, then the parties will be absolved from their liability under the contract, right. That is why contingent because happening of a particular thing that is absolving of uh, liability of parties under the contract, it is dependent on happening of a event which is force major, right. Thank you uh, everyone. With this, we uh, conclude with this session, 8th session on discharge of contract. Thank you. Hello, I am Shikha Dikshit. I teach psychology and I am with the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at IIT Kanpur. Today, I am going to talk about what is social cognition. Social cognition is a research area in psychology which explicates the various cognitive processes that people employ to understand the social world. So, essentially, it is about sense making of the social world, which involves understanding other people as well as understanding oneself. Understanding others requires understanding their traits, their internal tendencies, their contextual aspects, motives, feelings, emotions, etc. So, as we can see, uh, this is a very complex process and requires a massive amount of information processing. Even for small decisions, for simple decisions, people have to process a large amount of information. The main uh, perspective or the approach which is used in social cognition is obviously the cognitive approach and which is the study of mental structures and processes. The main paradigm which is used is the information processing paradigm. As far as the range of topics in social con uh, cognition is concerned, the range is very wide from individual level sense making to collective sense making. As far as views of cognitive sense making are concerned, there are three major dominant views in social cognition, the naive scientist view, the cognitive miser view and the motivated tactician view. The naive scientist view emerged from research done in causal attribution and this refers to detailed and systematic processing of information and sense making in the social world. However, it is not always, it is not always possible to make detailed uh, cognitive, to engage in detailed cognitive processing and hence people act as cognitive misers in many situations. So, whenever there is lack of time and cognitive effort is less, then people involve in uh, using certain strategies which, which are functional yet they are like mental shortcuts. So, this is the cognitive miser approach. However, the question that comes to the fore is that which one of the two strategies is more important? The answer is provided by the motivated tactician view. And according to this view, people can either use the knife scientist approach or the cognitive miser approach 
as and when required and they can switch over between the two approaches when required. So, these are the three major views which are utilized to understand cognitive sense making. The topics that uh, co social cognition covers uh, ranges from uh, cognitive social cognition to social social cognition. So, topics such as causal attribution, understanding of attitudes, social schemas, unconscious cognition about social situations, the use of mental shortcuts or heuristics in decision making, social, uh, social identity and stereotypings, uh, stereotyping processes are some of the topics. In addition to this, a large number of social cognitive psychologists also understand collective sense making in terms of social representations.